Hey, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, this is Yi Chui. I'm a executive editor of Nano Letter. On behalf of the chief editor, Terry Odom, I would like to welcome all of you back to the Nano Science Global Lecture. Um, so this event, as uh, we started since uh, last September to celebrate the 20 years of uh, Nano Letters. I would like to thank all of you to uh, support this event by attending the event and also the excellent speaker uh, since September we have. Um, and this month event, <laughs> we are fortunate to have uh, three outstanding experts to talk about nanoscience related topics, including John Rogers from Northwestern University, Hao Chen Wang from Rice University, and Jennifer Dayang uh, uh, from Stanford University. Uh, we'll start uh, the, the uh, webinar with uh, John's talk. Let me introduce John first, and then I will uh, certainly, when I, Hao Chen and Jen come up to the stage, I will in in introduce them individually. Well, John is a uh, very well known, uh, uh, really, you know, no need to introduce in details. Uh, John currently is a professor of material science engineering, biomedical engineering, uh, and uh, neurological surgery. Uh, department and by uh, courtesy of electrical and computer engineering, mechanical engineering, chemistry at Northwestern University. What well, John has done uh, quite a lot of amazing work spanning so many areas. Uh, I, will not, I will not go into the details. Uh, he's really a leader in the field. He has been recognized by numerous awards, including MacArthur Fellow in 2009, uh, MIT Lamerson Award in 2010 and MIS Matter 2018. Uh, he's also a member of National Academy of Sciences, uh, National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine, and National Academy of Inventors, uh, as well as American Academy of Arts and Sciences. With that, I will let John uh, take over. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Yi. So uh, as we were discussing before, I got my second Moderna vaccine yesterday, so I'm a little groggy. And so instead of giving my talk live, I recorded it yesterday and I'm going to play the recording, but I'll be around for a Q&A and the panel discussion. So I'm not going anywhere, but I'm going to play play the recording the best way to do it. So let's get this started. Uh, OK, hopefully you can you can see that and we'll go ahead and uh, play it. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is John Rogers. I'm here at Northwestern University, and I want to begin by thanking uh, Yi and Terry for inviting me to participate in this nanoscience global lecture, um, you know, in recognition of the 20th anniversary of nano letters, a real sort of uh, outlet, you know, a uniquely powerful outlet for research in nanotechnology for so many years. And everybody who's been associated with the journal needs to be congratulated on the excellent work they've done in, in stewarding this important research, uh, resource for the uh, research community, uh, <clears throat> including my own group. Uh, and so I'll try to sort of outline some of the things that we've done in nanotechnology, specifically for applications in what we're referring to as biocompatible electronics. And I'll get into a description of what that's all about by beginning with a, a context and a motivation and a set of schemes that have worked pretty well for us in this uh, area where nanomaterials and nanoscience really plays a central role along with assembly approaches and integration uh, schemes to, to build real functional platforms that have unique applications in biological research uh, and clinical medicine in certain cases. And so my home department is material science and engineering. So most of what we do has a strong materials component uh, at its core, but but we, we are also interested in system level engineering. And so we uh, also incorporate in our Group, uh, group's efforts, uh, activities in, in electrical and computer engineering, uh, biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, and many of the things we do involve sort of a clinical interface as well. I had an appointment in neurological uh, surgery to kind of facilitate those 
actions. But at a very high level, what, what we're hoping to do with this notion of biocompatible electronics is to really blur the distinction between man-made electronic systems and the kind of electrical constructs that one encounters in the biological world. And maybe the easiest area to think about, area of opportunity in uh, human health anyway, is uh, you know in the context of the human brain. It's biology's most sophisticated form of electronics. And if you want to study how the brain operates or you want to deliver electrical stimulation and patterns that could address various sorts of brain disorders you'd like to bring to bear to that problem, man's most sophisticated form of electronics, the silicon CMOS integrated circuit. But if you think about that kind of integration, there are you know enor enormous hurdles uh, to, to achieving that uh, kind of outcome uh, due to the dissimilar properties between you know the soft time dynamic moist textures of the of the human brain and the and the rigid planar inorganic materials that that are used to build silicon integrated circuits and so uh, the the question is what can you do from the standpoint of nanotechnology and material science to, to bridge that massive chasm between uh, man's electronic systems and uh, you know biology's uh, form form of electronics and and if you could figure out how to do that that you, you probably would want to leverage that technology not only in the context of the brain, but uh, you know in the context of other vital organs of, of the body. The, the heart, for example, is an electromechanical system. And what would be possible if you could wrap the outside surface of the heart, the, the epicardial surface, when, with thin, soft electronics that could monitor electrophysiological behavior and maybe stimulate in a spatiotemporal uh, pattern that, that would uh, alleviate sort of symptoms and, and occurrences of, of uh, arrhythmias. And you know, there are other you know, places where you could think about integration. Uh, we've worked on the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves, the kidney, the lung, the diaphragm, the bladder, other, other places. Um, you know, man's largest organ, the, the skin, is, is a, a particularly attractive uh, point of integration because uh, that, that kind of integration could be done in a very minimally invasive and, and low-risk manner. And so thinking about these same kinds of ideas in biocompatible electronics in the context of, of skin turns out to be uh, some, something sort of interesting. Uh, as well. But if that's your overall goal is to, to really intimately integrate new forms of electronics with living systems, it's useful to take a step back and think about the key uh, engineering design principles that one sees in biology generally uh, and may, maybe in, in the human body specifically. And this slide just highlights some, some of those features, not with an eye toward uh, attempting to to replicate them one to one in engineered, you know, man-made systems, but but just as context to think about the kinds of uh, principles that might uh, one might be able to adapt and and incorporate in, into engineering uh, platforms. And so there's a huge range of length scales associated with uh, you know active elements in biology, all the way from molecular to macroscopic. Sort of obvious. It's uh, you know involving intrinsically 3D sort of design approaches and architectures. It's hard materials together with soft materials as electronic, fluidic, mechanical function. Uh, these platforms are reconfigurable, they're mechanically active, they're multi-component, really unbelievably sophisticated, you know, if you think about it through the through the eyes of, of, of an engineer. And so so what what uh, you know, it, it looked like, and um, you know, what what are the challenges? I tried to frame the problem, you know, a couple of slides back, but but to just uh, think about it in the context of um, you know silicon integrated circuits, it's just radically different in terms of uh, you know the intrinsic design principles. It's not really 3D; it's just layered, uh, you know, stacks of materials in in a planar geometry. You know, it's it's a hard mechanically hard uh, ty type of uh, platform. It's, it's not flexible. In many cases, the materials themselves are incompatible with, with biology. And, and so the question is, how, how could you reformulate without abandoning any of the kind of sophistication and function that, that's currently supported with uh, silicon CMOS technology as represented by, by this image? Uh, what would it take from the standpoint of material science to make this kind of uh, technology look more like biology to allow that kind of integration. And that, that really sets the stage for a, a whole host of what we feel are pretty interesting uh, topics in, in basic research with, you know, uh, applied, you know, potential for 
for really uh, you know developing tools that could be used to to study biology in in a deeper way, or maybe um, you know systems that could address uh, unmet needs in in clinical medicine. So there are two two ways you can think about this. One is to uh, you know abandon the kinds of uh, inorganic materials that currently serve as the foundations for you know, consumer electronics gadgetry and move from silicon to a polymer-based semiconductor, for example, and move away from photolithography and, and think about sort of additive printing approaches. And I think there are a lot of uh, interesting research topics along that particular pathway uh, to, to this kind of reformulation that, that we're contemplating. But then the other way would be to think uh, in terms of nanotechnology, you know, could, could you sort of uh, deploy these same kinds of constituent materials, but not in, in bulk kind of wafer forms? Could, could you create nanoscale forms of uh, silicon? And could you combine those structures with uh, both uh, inorganic and inorganic materials to create kind of a hybrid solution? Uh, to, to this goal of, of biocompatible electronics. And, and that's the, the route that uh, has been most successful for us. Uh, I guess we've, we've thought about both, both schemes and it's really that second one founded in, in nanotechnology that, that uh, seems to work, work pretty well. So we kind of have uh, three overarching uh, targets in this broader space of biocompatible electronics. And, and this slide kind of illustrates those three streams of work. The first one is in the development of thin, soft, uh, electronics in the form of um, you know, membranes that can integrate with uh, moving surfaces uh, of the body or, or living systems in, in general. This is a uh, illustration or a picture of a skin-like device uh, laminated directly onto the human epidermis for recapitulating the kinds of uh, vital signs monitoring that is currently confined to clinical or laboratory settings. These, these kinds of devices can provide that kind of function continuously and in a wireless sort of mode. And I'll step you through the, the key ideas there and, and what we've been able to do in terms of uh, translation of, of those technologies out, out of the academic setting and into the real world. The second area is uh, a little bit different where we're uh, thinking about uh, materials that uh, are biodegradable to provide sort of temporary function in the context of transient biological processes such as uh, wound healing, for example, where you might want a device to sort of track the healing process or maybe provide local uh, electrical stimulation or drug release functionality. But, but after the wound is healed, you wouldn't need the device anymore. And it would be ideal if you could build it out of biodegradable materials so that the device and its associated load and, and risk to the patient is naturally eliminated. Uh, through uh, hydrolysis or, or enzymatic degradation, for example. So thinking about uh, biodegradable transient uh, electronic platforms is kind of another area. And then the third third space is really think about this uh, idea of three-dimensionality uh, in the overall uh, designs of the electronics and, and moving from layered uh, collections of thin film materials to sort of open network type architectures that, that could really engage uh, with a living system beyond surfaces to sort of full three dimensional volumetric spaces. And, and that's kind of a third area. So I'm going to step through each of these three areas, just to give you a sense of uh, you know, what we've been able to do, what we're, what we're thinking about. And this will be pretty uh, uh, relatively high level. Uh, and so all of the details can be found in the publications. And uh, you know, if you have questions, uh, I think there'll be a Q&A period and you can feel free to email me directly if you, if you want to know more about these uh, sort, sort of te technology. So I'll start with this thin skin light. Uh, Electronics and, and the question there is, um, you know, if you want to uh, build that kind of technology out of silicon to exploit the extremely high performance capabilities that uh, silicon as a semiconductor uh, can provide, you, you certainly couldn't um, you know, use silicon in a wafer-based format. You, you need to think about a different structural embodiment. And, and there we like the idea of silicon nanomembranes. So this is where nanotechnology is coming into the picture for us. Uh, in the context of mechanics and, and thinking about extreme scaling down of the thickness of a wafer from sort of a millimeter uh, type of length scale in, into formats that you know, uh, would, would involve thicknesses kind of in the range of 10 to 100 uh, nanometers. There are various ways to create this kind of nanostructural for, form of silicon. But if you think about the implications of that, uh, it really qualitatively changes the way you think about the material uh, because the bending stiffness is scaling like a cube of the thickness. And so when you go from a millimeter to 10 or 100 uh, nanometers, the bending stiffness reduces by you know, 14, 15 orders of magnitude. Still silicon, 
is still thick enough to support the kind of electronic functionality you'd ultimately uh, want to be able to achieve. But but in a in a material structure that that's exceptionally uh, bendable from from the standpoint of low bending stiffness, but also from the standpoint of the minim, minimum radius of curvature that the structure can can be bent to uh, before. Uh, you know, exceeding the the fracture strains of of the silicon itself due due to this uh, inverse uh, scaling or the linear scaling of the peak strains associated with bending to a given radius of of curvature on on thickness. So so reduction in thickness creates a floppy and very very flexible form uh, of silicon. Uh, but it can't uh, simply replace the silicon wafer because it's not really mechanically strong enough. Uh, to, to serve as a platform for any kind of practical device. So you really have to think about these silicon nanomembranes as, as building block materials that you integrate on a substrate of interest. And that could be a sheet of plastic or a slab of rubber. rubber. And if you uh, think about sort of managing the interface adhesion between radically dissimilar classes of materials, so, so silicon and silicone, for example, uh, that in itself can be a very daunting challenge from, from a materials science and a materials chemistry standpoint. But here again, thickness scaling comes to your rescue because the energy release rate parameter G, uh, which is defining sort of the propensity of a crack to form between two uh, material structures, scales down with, with the thickness. And, and this is uh, again, you know, com coming to your rescue because a nan nanoscale form of silicon then becomes very easy to, to bond to a dissimilar substrate material. And that's kind of illustrated here just qualitatively uh, in the form of this uh, sort of pr uh, cantilevered uh, structure of silicon sitting on a, a machined ridge uh, in a, a plastic substrate. And there, there's really no uh, specific adhesion chemistry going on here. It's just Van der Waals forces, but they're sufficiently strong due to that linear downscaling of the energy release rate. So these are sort of simple concepts concepts, but they actually have a very profound implications because now you can start to think about you know, flexible, you know, high-performance silicon-based uh, electronics uh, by, by exploiting nan nanostructured forms of silicon. And so then the next question is, how do you create this stuff in the, in the first place? How do you create nano ribbons, nano membranes of, of silicon? There's certainly a lot of interesting approaches to, to the direct growth of those materials. But then the other way you can think about it is to use the silicon wafer as a starting point. It's a very sophisticated piece of materials technology. Are there ways to sort of anti tropically etch uh, a silicon wafer, you know, shave off the near surface region, very thin uh, elements of silicon. And, and would that would that be an alternative path? And it turns out to be a very powerful uh, sort of strategy. And you can kind of do this. There's ver various ways. In, in this case, we have a, a silicon wafer with a proper uh, orientation. We're using an anisotropic uh, etching uh, to undercut, you know, from the near surface region, these ribbons uh, of silicon. We just slice them off. You can work your way down through the, the thickness of the silicon, create, create really sort of gram level quantities of um, your device grade silicon structures in that way or you can do it in sort of in a, in a parallel fashion this is something we published in nano uh, letters some some years back you can sort of sculpt the side walls you can uh, use directional deposition to uh, deposit metal uh, etch resists and then uh, you know in a single etching step you can you can lift off the the, the wafer uh, really bulk quantities of these uh, silicon nano and, and you can do that with three fives as well. We've shown that you can uh, create multi-layer stacks by by NDE or MOCVD. Uh, and here we have sacrificial uh, etch release layers that, that can be removed selectively in, in HF. And so this is another way to create bulk quantities of uh, semiconductor nanomaterials uh, where we're kind of exploiting that ultra thin geometry. Uh, standpoint of the mechanics. And then the question would be, how do you manufacture with those materials? And, and we like approaches that provide deterministic control, so soft lithographic inspired type approaches where we're printing not chemistries, but actually uh, nanomaterial structures. Uh, and so those processed wafers become inking pads. Uh, you can ink them uh, onto the surface of a stamp, and you can use that stamp to print them down onto a substrate of interest. And you can do this in very high throughput manner with very precise control and very high yields. And so this is an example of that. Uh, gallium ar uh, arsenide nanomembranes printed onto a sheet of plastic and then bent uh, onto a cylindrical glass support to just show you the mechanics that we were talking about previously. So then you sort of fast forward, uh, you know, you can begin to take those ideas, you combine them with uh, your buckling mechanics and sort of full system level mechanics modeling. So, so you can 
uh, really uh, distribute these na nanomaterials in an intelligent way to build full functional systems that can be engineered precisely to have physical properties that match uh, those of a, of a targeted biological tissue, uh, skin be being an example where we've spent a lot of time. So, so you can do all of that. It becomes, you know, uh, very, very much engineering in, in the orientation of, of the work, but, but you can do it. And uh, we've been focused on uh, maybe the most compelling uh, clinical needs, and, and those include uh, monitoring of vi vital signs in, in premature babies. And so here we've been able to put together you know, these nanomaterial uh, approaches and, and, and build devices that have skin-like properties and wireless uh, modes of operation to, to reproduce the kinds of recordings that are done today with uh, you know, taped on uh, biosensors and hardwired connections to external boxes of data acquisition electronics. This is 31 week delivery uh, premature baby at Lurie Children's Hospital. This hand over here, just to set the scale, it's Aaron Hombas. He's head of uh, neonatology at Lurie Children's. So we work very closely with the uh, clinical community on this. And uh, we've been able to move, move it uh, beyond just, just local hospitals here in, in Chicago to, to really global uh, scale through uh, generous support by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Save the Children organization. We had to change the uh, design uh, you know, aspects of, of those initial devices to allow their deployment into lower and middle income countries, resource constrained areas of the globe. But we were able, able to do that and publish all the details in Nature Medicine about, it, about a year ago. So we're in uh, 23 uh, countries at this point. Um, Zambia, Kenya, Ghana, in, in Africa. I spent some time in Zambia myself. Uh, many thousands of these devices now used uh, around the world, focused on uh, neonatal health, but also maternal and fetal health as well, straight through the intrapartum uh, period, because there's a lot of mortality associated with uh, childbirth. And so if you can uh, continuously monitor the health of the mother uh, and the newborn uh, baby, then, then maybe you can kind of uh, you know, reduce that, that rate of uh, mortality. So th this is the kind of thing that we're working on. We have uh, deep engagements across the clinical community, focusing on end of life and uh, beginning of life. So uh, neonatal, pediatric, maternal, fetal health on one end of that spectrum, and then on the other, uh, Parkinson's patients, stroke survivors, Alzheimer, uh, dementia uh, patients, and so on. And this is to give you kind of a, a snapshot picture of some of the things that are uh, entering that translational pipeline, moving out of the academic uh, lab here in, in, into, the, into the real world where, where these uh, ideas can uh, be of direct uh, benefit to, to patients is the ultimate goal. So that's the first area. The second area is this uh, notion of biodegradable electronics and, and sort of temporary uh, implants as a almost a form an engineering form of medicine is the way you could kind of kind of think about it uh, because it is temporary but but it operates uh, based on engineering pr uh, principles but rather than uh, biochemical uh, mechanisms and so so here uh, we kind of stumbled across the the fact that silicon itself is water soluble I think it was a highly under uh, appreciated aspect of silicon chemistry but if you're playing around with these ultra thin membranes and ribbons of silicon uh, what what you can't help but notice is if they uh, remain uh, immersed in uh, you know uh, an aqueous solution uh, with physiological pH and, and physiological uh, temperature, uh, the material itself dissolves away uh, and and it disappears entirely uh, in two or three weeks. Now this is a very slow rate of dissolution. Uh, the, ch the chemistry and the, and the rate rates of these reactions are, are very, very slow, few nanometers per day. So you wouldn't ordinarily notice uh, this kind of chemistry if you're sort of working with a silicon wafer uh, based technology. But, but with these nano membranes and nano ribbons of silicon, uh, it really has a profound uh, consequence in, on the way that you think about the material. The other aspect here is that the end products of this dissolution is uh, dissolving by hydrolysis are actually biocompatible, naturally occurring in biofluids. It's silicic acid and a tiny bit of hydrogen. So we got very excited when we uh, noticed uh, this, this chemical reaction and, and thought about its rate in the context of uh, different kind of envisioned applications around uh, human health and began to um, you know, put together a, a broader portfolio of materials that you could pair with device-grade nanomembranes of silicon to begin to build 
full integrated circuit systems that uh, you know have this unique characteristic of being uh, water soluble to biocompatible in products. And I won't go through the details. We published many papers, you know, some years back to just uh, establish a foundation uh, for this area of transient uh, electronics. So a number of different semiconductors, dielectrics are available. Many different kinds of metals can be used. They're not the kinds of conventional metals you would see in a CMOS foundry, but but these metals can be processed. They can be integrated together with these different materials. You can put everything on a bioresorbable polymer substrate, silk fibrin, for example, PCL, collagen, uh, a number of different options there. And you put it all together, you end up with kind of an interesting uh, platform technology, one one that offers silicon levels of sophistication and performance, but, but with this very interesting feature that it's totally um, you know, water soluble and some of our initial work was funded by DARPA and we put together this movie uh, at their uh, request. Um, and you know, then the question is, what what is it good for? And there, there'll be a lot of things. I mean, Dar DARPA had their own interests. We were really focused on applications in, in clinical medicine. And we've been approached by many uh, members of that uh, community uh, around new ideas for, for using temporary implants. And this is one of them. I just described this very quickly. This is a, a device that goes uh, in, into the body. It, it provides electrical stimulation, currently done only intraoperatively. But with a bioresorbable device, you can just insert it uh, at the, the site of the damaged peripheral nerve. You can apply uh, stimulation uh, at a proximal site. And that electrical stimulation is known to accelerate the healing process. But currently, only only done uh, intraoperatively because you you no longer have access to the to the nerve and, and ultimately you want the stimulator to disappear after the the healing process has occurred and so bioresorbable electronics becomes very powerful in this context so th this is kind of a cartoon schematic illustration of how that would happen you either have a, a transection uh, injury or a crush injury of peripheral nerve you come into the hospital uh, you go into the operating room they suture uh, the damaged site of the nerve and then drop in into the patient uh, one of these wireless uh, biodegradable electrical stimulators to, to provide, provide that proximal stimulation currently done only intraoperatively. But in this kind of strategy, you can, you can dose out uh, that electrical stimulation at various time points throughout the healing process where the uh, end of life uh, of this device is, is complete bioresorption and, and elimination via uh, your natural processes. And so, so we're able to do that, put it all together. It's a silicon-based uh, platform with, with a wireless inductive coil for power delivery and wireless control. It's a cuff interface uh, to the damaged uh, nerve, and, and it's completely bioresorbable. Uh, and so it goes into the body and it dissolves and disappears on a time scale uh, of a couple of months, uh, providing an operational lifetime that's on, on the order of one to two weeks. And so we've done many uh, animal model studies of this kind of technology to, to illustrate the efficacy. And this is uh, you know, an illustration of the cumulative results of those animal model studies where the y-axis here is EMG amplitude. You can just think about that uh, as a metric uh, for the extent of healing of the uh, damaged sciatic nerve in this case. And uh, time uh, healing time uh, is on the x-axis in, in weeks, and we have three scenarios. One is a single day of electrical stimulation. That's basically reproducing the standard of care today, and you have a healing trajectory associated with that. Three days and six days uniquely enabled by transient electronics, and you can see the um, you know, the rate of healing increases as you increase the uh, duration of the stimulation from three to six days, but then the end outcome actually improves as well. And so again, we really like to think about this as an electronic neuroregenerative uh, medicine, and we're able to publish it in Nature uh, Medicine. And so it seems as though that that community is embracing these these kinds of new new concepts, uh, fundamentally enabled by by the technology. So with the last five minutes that I have, let me talk, talk about this third area. Again, nanotechnology in the context of biocompatible electronics, but now thinking uh, ahead and, and trying to envision approaches that don't simply involve you know, flexible or stretchable electronics integrated on biological surfaces, but instead open network type architectures that can engage through uh, a volumetric uh, space. And then the question is, um, you know, how do you Create those kinds of structures in, in the in the first place, and and we like um, approaches that exploit mechanical buckling. And so what I'm going to illustrate here is a uh, FEA-based movie of that buckling process, which uh, allows us to accomplish a geometrical transformation from a 2D layout into one of these open 3D type 
NAR, uh, network architectures. And so I'll show you that this process in the context of this filamentary interconnected 2D mesh structure, which we've bonded at local sites to a pre-stretched elastomer. Uh, and when you relax that pre-stretch, the elastomer returns to its original dimensions and it applies compressive stresses, compressive forces at all of those bonding locations. And so if you engineer this thing carefully, you can achieve a transformation from 2D up into 3D. And in this particular case, that 3D geometry consists of an array of helical coils as a base layer, and then another array of helical coils sitting on top of the first, but oriented 90 degrees relative to that first. Uh, array of helical coils. And so this is what it looks like in silicon, silicon nanomembranes. You can see the bonding sites here uh, defined by these square pads. And then you can see those helical coils, one uh, array sitting on top of uh, another. And so this works uh, quite well. It's qu a quite simple, uh, but very powerful strategy for moving into the third and uh, this is a cross-sectional view of that same structure, just to give you a sense of the extent of three-dimensionality that, that's possible. And this is silicon, but you can imagine uh, full integrated circuits, you know, sitting on top of this silicon platform. And so now you can move into the third dimension, very sophisticated forms of electronic circuits and stimulators and sensors and all kinds of uh, you know, things that might be interesting to, to, to engage biological systems. So here are two ways that you can sort of exploit those kinds of um, technologies as biointerfaces. One is to think of them as scaffolds, active electronic scaffolds around which uh, one grows, say in this particular example, neural tissue. So we take DRG uh, neurons from, from rats and we seed them on, on top of this, these scaffolds, in this case, in, in the form of a nested basket structure with arrays of electrodes that are independently addressable. And so you end up with the natural formation of a neural tissue in 3D but one uh, in which you can probe and manipulate the uh, neural circuitry that forms around those structures. And so you can see individual firing events, you, you can stimulate, uh, and you can be, begin to engage with, with biology in its natural state, its 3D state, going far beyond you know, anything that's possible uh, with, with a conventional 2D multi-electrode array system. So that, that strategy number one. Strategy number two is to gently interface uh, three-dimensional collections of uh, electrodes, electronics, optoelectronics around preformed uh, biological tissues. In this case, in, in the context of a brain spheroid, this is a cortical spheroid in this case. This is a small sphere, about a half millimeter in diameter. And what we've done here is we've created, through this kind of buckling process, a basket structure fully instrumented with electronic components and sensors and stimulators and so on that we can open up because of the reversibility of that buckling process. We can locally apply some strain to the underlying elastomer substrate, open that structure up, and then gently close it after inserting a brain uh, spheroid in, into that uh, fr framework. And so now we have the ability to interrogate and stimulate and monitor uh, neural processes associated with this uh, brain. Spheroid, and that, that turns out to be uh, very, very unique. Here's an example of electrophysiological uh, monitoring across the entire surface of that spherical neural tissue. Uh, and that this is something that one obviously can't do with a 2D MEA, but, but these ideas in uh, you know, nanomaterials, and in this case, uh, buckling-based 3D assembly, uh, really provide new, new capabilities for this uh, area of biological uh, research. And so with that, I think I'm pretty much out of time. I just want to acknowledge the senior collaborators that have been involved in this work. We're highly collaborative groups, so we work with folks in engineering science, uh, names listed here, but, but ultimately we're trying to build biocompatible electronics for a purpose. And so we work closely with the neuroscience community to understand what kind of new tools and capabilities can, can be enabled by these ideas and also you know, thinking about it in, in the context of human health and clinical medicine. And, and the, these are, are some of the collaborators that have been involved uh, in, the, in the work that I described to you, uh, you know, in this, in this talk. But I always like to end my presentations by acknowledging the students. Uh, it's really wonderful, you know, to have a chance to, uh, you know, interact and, and work closely with these very bright young people, uh, energetic, lots of great ideas. They do all the work. I just get to talk about it. So I want to acknowledge them for all their hard work and their, their great ideas. And thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Well, John, thank you so much for the uh, outstanding talk. Um, I've been watching certainly your research for <laughs> for a long time. Um, so 
you uh, share three big topical area, really summarizing what you have been doing uh, in the past uh, a couple of decades. Um, I still remember from uh, very early that you published maybe the first few papers. Uh, making nanomaterials, many people are doing bottom-up approach or chemical synthesis. Then about a couple of decades ago, you came along, you said, well, I'll start with wafer from top down. Uh, but really get down to the scale, three-dimensional kind of patterning, and then release the structure that I can have the right mechanical property. At the same time, uh, using this wafer, because they are growing in a very high quality, like electron mobility and, and, and so on. Um, so if you look back for the past uh, couple of decades and, and look at bottom-up and, and your approach or top-down, are there more learning throughout this whole process you can share with us? You know, it looks like you're marching along this, uh, this approach really well for a couple of decades, you know, generating a lot of amazing stuff. If you, if you look back at the approach you're, you're, you're going down and share with us your kind of comparison uh, in the last couple of decades. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. So. First off, I would say, you know, our approaches were sort of defined almost by necessity because I didn't want to uh, compete with you and your are <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're too good, you know, and I'm not uh, a, a chemist at that level. So, so that was kind of one consideration. But, um, you know, I think the other was um, around trying to maintain alignment with um, industry to, to, to whatever extent you know, that that's possible, you know, and, and uh, without sort of um, compromising the ability to get to the endpoint. So um, that's kind of in the mindset. I, I wouldn't say that uh, top down is going to be suitable for for everything. Um, for our particular systems, it seems to work pretty well. But, uh, you know, there are growth approaches that that might be better aligned with with other sorts of applications. You, you've done a lot of work in batteries and you know, thing, things of that that sort might might just more naturally align with a growth approach where, where you really need kind of bulk quantities of materials and, you know, you need them to, to be grown on complex textured surfaces or, you know, things of that sort where, you know, maybe electronic properties are important, but they're not an overriding consideration and that maybe, you know, the, the volume and the scale and the deployment are, are more important than the, than the details around the purity and the crystallinity and so on. But um, yeah, I guess we've had kind of a somewhat eye toward, you know, practicality, I guess, a little bit, you know, like what what's going to work long, long term. And um, we've tried to spend most of our time on ideas that we we feel, you know, are, are scalable. And it may, may be a consequence of my um, career start being in industry, you know, there's kind of a pretty strong filter. Bell Labs is you know, great, great laboratories, a lot of fundamental science there, but you're embedded in an engineering organization and all kinds of old people, you know, been around for a long time and seen it all and be very, very critical of things that they, they don't feel will scale. Ed Chandros comes to mind, but I think that's probably, you know, a healthy thing, at least for me and in, in shaping my thoughts around what, what kind of ideas are worth spending time on and what kind of ideas maybe other people are already going to do more effectively than, than than we could, but yeah, I was just looking. I mean, some some of the early papers. I mean, a lot of those uh, ideas are still around, and they and they work for us. So I think I think maybe that's that's a good sign. Not not everything is going to work out, but I think a pretty good chunk of this stuff has has sort of you know evolved over time. I would say you know like the 3D stuff though is kind of lunatic fringe still a little bit, you know, maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't. It seems like uh, there might be something interesting there, but it's much less immediate in terms of exactly how we would exploit those kinds of ideas by comparison to say the skin integrated stuff where there's a, a, a sort of fast track to translation. But I, I don't know if that, that answers your question. What, what oh yeah, I, absolutely, I John. I, I think I really appreciate it. I, I myself have the interest also translation type of uh, research, mm -hmm. right? I, I appreciate your comment very much. Once you have the in industry perspective in mind and uh, the approach you are taking for particular technology and applications, then you know how to 
choose early on. So I, I think you are, you are exactly, I mean, the approach you are taking, it excites me. Yeah. Um, so one more question, right, for, for you also. I'll relate to your 3D lecture that just amazingly beautiful interfacing with uh, biology. Um, for neuron, for brain, uh, for example, um, certainly one thing is uh, having this uh, beautiful probe right there or, or sensing uh, electronics, how to embed those into, for example, into the brain, inject them into the brain without causing damage has been a challenge in, in, in the field. Do, do you want to share uh, with us about your thought uh, along this direction, you know, how to solve this issue? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's another good question. And so we have a number of different programs in neural interface technologies, I guess. I mean, a lot of other people as well, it's a broad community, but from the standpoint of uh, material science and, and engineering asking, you know, what kind of, uh, platforms would be of greatest utility to, to neuroscience research. And so we have active electronics that sort of, you know, laminate onto the surfaces of, of brains and animal models, nothing in humans yet, obviously, uh, that, that's a little bit more daunting, but, but, but sheets and then, you know, penetrating probes, you know, a lot, a lot of groups kind of working along those lines. I guess what we're attempting to do is to build cellular scale optoelectronic systems. So kind of beyond passive electrode arrays to multifunctional ultra miniaturized probes with you know fluidic delivery capabilities and you know light emission detection that 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 kind of thing so i i think those two platforms maybe have more immediate relevance and uh, you know i think these 3d structures as i mentioned before is a little bit more lunatic fringe we're just trying to you know feel it out a little bit and uh, i don't have a good answer for how do you embed them i mean you, you either have to grow around them or you uh, open them up and 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 close, you know, pre preformed uh, uh, tissue samples, and and those are the two strategies I I featured in this talk. But but yeah. the broader question of how do you get those types of three D networks into, you know, a fully formed neural tissue? That I don't know. I don't know how to do that. That <laughs> might be impossible. You know, it's a it's a tough one. Yeah, a challenge for the whole field to uh, tackle for the coming yeah. decade, right? So that that that's good. There are a lot of young students in in the audience, uh, right there. So uh, good for them to to think about. So so John, I think we'll uh, we'll we'll continue to the next mm -hmm. talk. Uh, uh, stay online with us. We'll we'll come back for the uh, panel discussion. Yep. Um. So let me now invite the uh, next speaker. Uh. Professor Hao Shen Wang uh, to come to the stage. He's currently an assistant professor in chemical engineering uh, at uh, Rice University. Uh, I was actually fortunate to be uh, his uh, PhD advisor when he was at Stanford uh, here working with me, uh, you know, a number of years ago. So after that, uh, he joined Harvard as a Roland Fellow. Uh, really established himself fast. Within two years, he has just been doing so well at Harvard and uh, uh, spent two years as Roland Fellow. He moved on to, uh, to Rice as a system professor. Um, he has been working in catalysis areas, absolutely coming up with very creative ideas. Uh, he has already been recognized by a number of awards uh, including MIS uh, Graduate Student Award, uh, and uh, he's uh, named Forbes 30 Under 30 in Science. Uh, so he's also a Sloan Fellow, uh, and particularly for nanolatter, he serves on the Early Career Advisory Board for, for nanolatters. With that, uh, Hao Chen, I would like to uh, take it from here. Well, thank you, E. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very nice and encouraging uh, introduction. And also thank you, E, and also uh, uh, Terry for your invitation to give me this great opportunity to share some of my uh, uh, recent years research uh, in this Nanoscience Global Lecture. So let me first begin with uh, sending my congratulations uh, to all the editorial members, uh, you know, authors, and also readers uh, for the uh, 20 year anniversary of Nano Letters. Uh, this is a remarkable journey for the past two decades 
uh, that influenced uh, generations of researchers in the nanotechnology field and also witnessed the great success of the uh, nanoscience development. And I also have some special personal feelings, of course, with nanometers. Like uh, my very first research paper that begins my catalysis career uh, was actually published uh, in nanometers about uh, eight years ago. I think when I was a, a PhD student in East Group. Uh, and uh, it's amazing when I review this paper, it has been already been cited for 17 uh, hundred times that uh, demonstrates the great visibility and the also uh, and the readability of the nanometers that has give us a great impact um, in all of these uh, nanotechnology fields. And that actually that paper when I prepared this slide that paper actually brought my um, memory actually back into uh, 2011 when I would just initially join the East group and it's so uh, surprising for me to think about already. I have known E for, for 10 years and this time really flies so fast. And I, I believe we know that in the next 10 years, the time will fly even faster. Just a few days ago, the, uh, the government announced the new uh, ambitions goals that the, uh, the, we will cut the US CO2 emissions in half in the next 10 years by 2030. So if we don't take actions that fast, uh, the 10 years will slip away from our hands really, really fast. Uh, I think the government, the great confidence in delivering this goal has been um, partially supported by the great and fast development of clean technology in the past several, several decades that with the, 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 the sufficient and efficient uh, harvest, energy harvesting systems that we can now produce clean electricity in relatively cheap price and the prices continue to decrease. And we have a central goal set several years ago that we can bring the solar energy price to about three cents per kilowatt hour. And the, there was a recent DOE, a new target to further bring that target back to two cents per kilowatt hour. So in the future, we will have a lot of clean and cheap elect electrons, electricity, and how we're gonna use these electrons or becomes opportunity and also challenging issue. So our idea is, if we can combine these clean electricity together with very accessible molecules uh, from the air, such as CO2, oxygen, water, and the nitrogen, and so on, with the help of catalysts, we probably can store those electric energies into very thin chemical bonds, like CH bonds, HH bonds, like hydrogen, or CC bonds, and so on. For a lot of applications, uh, in energy storage, as well as uh, green synthetic pathways for fuels and chemicals. And among those uh, electrochemical processes, the CO2 reduction actually received the tremendous attention over the past several years, not only because it has been able to enable us so many uh, reaction pathways to generate different type of products uh, from C1 products, you know, CO, methane, all the way to C3 product like N-propanol and so on. But also it, it's because it can actually receive very strong market driving force to produce these chemical feedstocks from CO2 while we can, we can reduce the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere. So a very, uh, a, a previous work that, the, that has been done by a Professor, Tar uh, professor Sargent uh, in U Toronto to do a techno-economic analysis and we are very um, uh, happy to see that by, uh, by further bringing down the electricity cost, it is very promising for us to use this CO2 reduction technology to produce the necessary chemical compound we use every day that can compete the cost we currently produce them from traditional chemical engineering, especially for these two compounds, CO and formic acid, because of the performance uh, in uh, using electrochemistry are relatively uh, uh, strong. But however, uh, it's still a far way for us to deliver this target. It's because the, we, we will need to develop our uh, synthetic uh, reactor system that to meet very strict criteria for us to deliver the cost target. For example, you need to produce the chemical compounds using electricity, but delivering very high current densities. And the bottom line is about 100 million per cent in a lot of the industrialized 
uh, electrochemical process, the current density can even reach up to one amp per cent squad. That can, can that can significantly bring down your capital cost. And also by delivering these high current densities, you are also need to deliver very high product selectivity. The electrons needs to be uh, highly selectively dumping to uh, CO2 for a specific uh, uh, target product. And by matching these two performance metrics, you will need to stably run your, uh, yourself, your, your catalyst, for over thousands of hours uh, to reduce the operation cost. And those performance targets are extremely difficult for us to deliver at the same time. Therefore, it's not only by developing the catalytic materials can deliver us there. Uh, there is always an importance for us to emphasize on the catalytic reactor engineering. So coupling these two together, we probably can help us to finally, to eventually uh, get this goal. Uh, that is also the philosophy of my group's development. We both focus on the catalytic materials design, as well as engineer the novel reactors to further push the catalytic reactors performance. And these two, these two major thrusts in my group are actually not independent lines, parallel lines. They are interconnected at a lot of the points during our development. For example, when we have a new catalyst coming out, we always like to test them in our catalytic reactors uh, to see if they can be adapted to the, to the, to the uh, reactors. At the same time, we, we have some reactors coming out. We always want to use our standard catalyst to test its performance and to see if we can further improve the catalytic materials. And, and with that, I would like to share uh, some representative examples over the past several years uh, uh, in both materials design and reactor engineering uh, in this lecture. So um, there are, of course, great challenges uh, in C2RR, a CO2 reduction reaction, uh, mainly because of the uh, catalytic materials are not selective enough. And I always want to emphasize there are uh, three typical challenges. First of all, there are strong competition from hydrogen evolution reactors because the CO2 needs to be coupled with protons that comes from water. And when you apply negative potentials, not only CO2 can grab your electrons, water will also be like to grab the electrons to produce hydrogen. So we don't want hydrogen. We want the, the CO2 to get the electrons. You need to get very high phreatic efficiencies. So that's a one typical challenge. And also low selectivities. You see all of these pathways are very close in their thermodynamic potentials. So electrons can freely choose their pathway to different products. That's not what we want if you really want to industrialize this process. And also for high value products, so many electron transfers, the activity will also be low. That actually relies the key development of electronic properties of the catalyst that can help us to guide the electron pathways towards a specific target. So uh, there is always a, 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 an interesting example that I want to share with the audience is uh, the importance of electronic properties uh, in guiding the uh, CO2R performances. Like we, if we look at the platinum gold, they only have one B electron difference, but their materials property and their electronic properties are so different that results in a completely different catalytic performance in CO2RR. As we know that platinum is uh, the best hydrogen evolution catalyst. It never dumps electrons to CO2, but its neighbor, gold, is till today the best CO2 reduction to CO catalyst. So if we move our attentions away from these noble metals to those uh, uh, low cost transition metals like uh, cobalt, iron, nickel, and so on, People at the beginning really think about uh, the nickel as a good candidate, not only because it's a very good HR catalyst to compete with CO2 reduction, but also it can be easily poisoned by CO. So you don't want a product that you want that cannot dissolve away from your surface. So at the beginning, we tested the nickel surface. You see, the, most of the electrons goes to hydrogen 100% exclusively. At that time, our idea is if we can further shrink the size of nickel nanoparticles to isolated single atoms. Here I say single atoms is referring to atoms not floating around in the air, but it is confined in some well-defined substrate, but there is no nickel-nickel direct interaction. 
So we can continuously change the band structure from a metallic band structure to discrete band structures. That could dramatically change the electronic properties and as well as the so catalytic performance. So that idea at the beginning was confirmed uh, by uh, collaboration with Professor Jens Noskov and Samira uh, uh, in 2017 at that time. Uh, we successfully developed these nickel single atom doped in graphene effects and simulate each of the elementary steps of situ reduction and conclude that those single atomic sites might be the active site for CO2 reduction uh, compared to nickel, because we can see when CO formed, the desorption becomes so difficult. But on the single atomic site, the CO desorption becomes uh, uh, much easier than the nickel surface. But at the very beginning, my poster, Kun Jiang, uh, uh, take that task. Uh, to synthesize those nickel single atoms. But at, at the very beginning, we have very little experience how we can systematically control and synthesize those nickel single atoms. So at the beginning, we just mix everything together, nickel and carbon, and, and com uh, come up with this core shell, uh, a nickel nanoparticle core and graphene shell structure. And that actually gives us some of the opportunity. Number one is, first of all, if our graphene shell can tightly surround the nickel nanoparticles, we can prevent the direct con contact between the nickel nanoparticle and water to suppress the HER. At the same time, when we introduce, intentionally introduce some defects during the synthetic process of the graphene, we can probably trap a lot of the nickel atoms inside the shell so that it can form the single atomic site. And we, we started to use some of the atom probe tomography, which is one of the most sophisticated nanoscale uh, detection technologies, to see if we can find some direct evidence that we successfully synthesize some single atoms on the surface. We cut, we sharp the samples into a very sharp tip, and by applying a high potential, high voltage between the sample tip and a two dimensional mass bag. And we can evaporate the atoms out of the sample tip each by inch and detect by the three by the, the mass back and then reconstruct them back into the three-dimensional tomography. And we can see if we focus on the sample tip, we can get this tomography with each of the elements, with each of the uh, pixels represented by a uh, carbon, nickel, and nitrogen. The red is carbon, a uh, green is nickel. And we can see if we zoom into some specific locations carbon rich, especially carbon rich locations, we can see the graphene layers can be killed, can be accurately resolved by this atom probe tomography. And on top of that, we can have uh, a direct evidence of the nickel single atoms doping the graphene defects. And that gives us the great confidence. Those surface sites might covered with a lot of the nickel single atomic site. By testing that in our traditional H cell reactors, we see that by applying more and more negative potentials, our CO generation to spread efficiency continues to ramp up to more than 90% while this hydrogen evolution reaction was suppressed to below 10%. And if we have a direct comparison between this nickel single atom catalyst and this nickel metal catalyst, this is a very different uh, reaction pathway selection as we can see uh, the reaction pathway is completely flipped over when we change the electronic structures of the same metal. Um, and the stability also runs very well. Uh, and at, after catalysis, we do see that the core shell structure still well maintained. The nickel cannot in contact with water to generate hydrogen. That's good. But the, the, the following question and very natural question is, um, even, even though we have this core shell structure, we don't use the nickel nanoparticles here for catalysis. The only reaction sites are on the surface. So why don't we still need to have these nickel nanoparticles in our system? The, the next generation of our catalysts, we try to get rid of these na nickel nanoparticles because they are not you know, uh, uh, CO2R friendly in our system. We don't want it to be exposed to, in water. So we just directly start with some uh, graphene nanosheets and try to spray coat trace amount of nickel atoms on the surface. By a, do a simple thermal annealing, those atoms are automatically sucked into the defects to show us with these isolated nickel single atoms. And the performance can become even better compared to the first version of 
the core shell structure, as we can see, the, uh, over 95% of CO selectivity and below um, 8 or 5% of hydrogen emission can be compressed. If we directly compare these nickel graphene layers, single atom catalyst, compared with the nickel graphene share catalyst we just showed, you see that our um, electrochemical window to deliver 90% selectivity becomes wider. But if you try to normalize the 10 over frequency based on the number of active sites, we surprisingly find out even though these two catalysts have completely different morphologies, they share exactly the same type of active site for the CO2RR to CO. That further demonstrates to us that the single atomic site is really the active site for CO2 reduction. And the next step is to see that even though the graphene has demonstrated very good performance, if we can further translate the active site, the nickel single atomic site, to some low-cost substrate like carbon black, which is thousands of times cheaper than the graphene, we can potentially scale up the material synthesis for large-scale productions. And we successfully uh, dig holes and spray coat nickel atoms and do the thermal annealing. And now we can see for one batch of synthesis, it's only limited by the reactor beaker. If you have a much bigger beaker uh, to synthesize these uh, thing atom catalysts, you can get kilogram scale. So now we can get, even in our lab scale, we can get a gram scale. So that will become no problem for us to scale up the production of nickel thing atom catalysts. And as we can see from the TEM, even on the surface of the carbon black, single atomic site is still um, uh, 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 easily uh, accessed. Um, and another challenge that we're facing if we really want to uh, scaling up the CO2 RR uh, uh, process is the current density. Because in traditional CO2 RR reactor, which is a traditional H cell reactor, our catalyst is actually emerging water and we bubble CO2 to saturate the electrolyte. And the CO2 you're using to reduce is only the soluble CO2 in water, which is only trace amount compared to water. 99.99% so uh, molecules surrounding your catalyst is actually water molecule and the CO2 is trace amount. So when you start to deplete your surface CO2 molecules, then, you, you, then your performance starts to be controlled by, by mass diffusions, not anymore by the kinetics. And we can see we always observe the CO selectivity ramp up to 90%. And if we want to still uh, deliver higher current, the selectivity starts to drop. Um, and hydrogen evolution reactions start to ramp up. So our idea at that time is to get, get a lot of inspirations from fuel cell reactors. If we can completely flush in gas phase CO2 instead of the liquid phase CO2, uh, we can have more than 95% of gas molecules that is coming from CO2 and only a few percent of water vapor so that we can uh, uh, completely resolve the mass diffusion challenge uh, to deliver a much higher current density that we can see from here using the exact the same type of catalyst but in different reactors we can ramp up the current density for one order of magnitude improvement while still maintaining more than 95 percent of CO selectivity uh, compared to this one it's only 10 million percent scale that is saturated uh, um, for for CO2 RR and with both catalytic materials scaling up and current density scaling up, we successfully developed this MEA uh, reactor uh, using our uh, house-made uh, uh, reactors. And we can see now out of this one unit cell, we can deliver 8 to 10 amp of CO2 R current. And this is only one unit cell. And if you really want to scale up the current, you can stack that into hundreds of, or thousands of stacks for large-scale production. Now, for out of this one unit cell, we can deliver three to four liters per hour of CO generation. And I, I think I only have a few more, uh, a few minutes left, or uh, let me sum it up very quickly. Uh, another product we are also focused on the formic gas uh, beyond CO, uh, beyond the carbon monoxide. But the challenge here in, in liquid generation from CO2 RR is the traditional liquid electrolyte we're using. We know that in the traditional electro liquid electrolyte, it has actually two fundamental functions in our reactors. Number one is the fast ion conduction. You need to conduct electricity between cathode and anode. 
while also it can collect the liquid, for example, CO2 reduction to formic acid, the liquid electrolyte to function as the carrier to carry out your uh, uh, liquid product. So that creates a big problem. Your liquid product generated from CO2RR is actually in a mixture with those liquid electrolytes. And you will need to have a downstream product separation process that is not only energy costly, but also cost uh, price costly. So the, pr the product is not actually a formic acid, it's actually formate mixed with salt. So our motivation is if we can directly by designing the reactor to get pure formic acid solutions to, to, to separate the product from the liquid electrolyte. So our idea gets strong inspirations from um, solid state batteries. A lot of the uh, 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 lithium ion battery field is now focusing on, including, including East Research. So if we can replace the liquid electrolyte with the poly, uh, ion conducting polymer solid lights so that we can completely separate the two functions. We still maintain very good fast ion conduction between cathode and anode while those polymers are not soluble in water. So once you have your formic acids formed in the middle of solid light chamber, you can flush them out by flowing DI water. So they will be completely separated from the liquid electrolyte. As we can see, using this device, by holding a 100 milliamp per cent square formate generation current, and we can continuously decrease the DI water flow rate. So you can further concentrate your formic acid product up to 30 weight percent, which is about six to seven more per liter of pure formic acid without any impurity ions. As we can see, the stability also runs very well. And also we further develop the cell by flushing the, the, so, uh, the formic acid product out, not only by water, but also by nitrogen vapor. So we demonstrate that this cell can be capable of producing up to 100 weight percent purity of formic acid. This has never been demonstrated before without any impurities inside. And also by changing the catalyst, we can produce acidic acid uh, uh, in large uh, current densities and also high purity. Changing the ideas to the oxygen reduction, we can also produce high concentration of hydrogen peroxide on site without any impurities. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk. I, I hope that my uh, uh, representative examples share with you uh, both the catalytic material design and re reactor engineering uh, can help to uh, develop the, um, the final target of our uh, electro um, catalytic reactors. Uh, with that, I would like to thank my talented uh, students in my group and also the funding agencies, collaboration facilities, which make uh, uh, this happening. Well, thank you, Hao Chen, for the very nice talk. Uh, very good dose of uh, electrocatalysis right here. Um, first question, Hao Chen. Um, you know, you have two areas. One is on uh, catalysis, uh, design synthesis, and uh, catalyzation. The other one is in more on the system, the, the reactor. So uh, my first question is, um, now with a normal reactor kind of engineering, how much that in the more in the device system level of thinking uh, to guide your catalysis, maybe the synthetic process, maybe preparation process in, on the left-hand side of your slide, the catalytic process. Is there something you learn, you feel, you feel like, you know, from the reactor level can feedback to guide your, you know, provide requirement for your design? Exactly. Catalyst, yeah. yeah. This is a very great question. Like what I mentioned, these two thrusts in my group are not parallel lines, actually. Uh, we get a lot of inspirations when we're developing these reactors because when you really uh, test your catalyst in a reactor, you know what's the limitations when you want to deliver high current density. And so, for example, the mass diffusions will always become a challenging part uh, in our reactors, uh, not only the intrinsic catalytic activities, because when we test the catalyst in a standard, you know, like H cell type uh, reactors, uh, we only focus on the in intrinsic activities and don't worry about too much about mass diffusions. But when mass diffusion coming in, uh, not only the intrinsic active side matters, but also the porosity of uh, the mass diffusion channels that plays an even more important role uh, in, in delivering high performance metrics. So um, 
that's for sure. Also, the development of in catalytic materials give us give us a lot of inspirations when we do, when we are uh, trying to design reactors because um, a different type of catalyst might uh, be uh, uh, you know in a different compatible with uh, the reactors such as the membrane, solid slide, and so on. We 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 get a lot of the um, uh, inspirations when uh, we test different type of catalysts in different membranes. They have different responses. So all of this uh, um, uh, can help us to think about deeply when we really want to use this catalyst uh, in our practical applications in the future. Yeah, I ask another short question. Uh, it's also coming from the audience. Um, so these electrocatalysis, uh, you know, current density, selectivity, stability, uh, these are all important. Uh, which one, how do you balance that? Particularly in thinking about single atom catalyst, I, I would say what is the stability, uh, a big concern. Uh, show, show me stuff about your thoughts, Haoxian. Yes, yes. So I think these three performance metrics uh, are all matters actually. Um, the current density, of course, uh, the, the higher current density you have, uh, the smaller device you can deliver the same capacity that the capital investment for your device will be lower. Uh, product selectivity that relates with your operation costs. You want higher product selectivity so that the, 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 the downstream separation and so on will be easier. But stability is usually always the uh, most challenging part because uh, uh, for a lot of catalysts, uh, membranes, reactors, the stability is not only um, a, a problem or an issue with the catalytic materials. So when, when we focus on catalytic material design, we don't we, we only focus on the stability of the catalyst. But when you test a catalyst in the reactor, a lot of other components may also play a role here. So for example, the single atom catalyst, when we want to extend the stability, uh, uh, I, we, we realize that not only the, the atoms um, might be leaching out during the process, but also it could catalyze some degradation of the membranes. So when we identify this problem, we are thinking about the ways to address that, for example, by coating a very thin layer of protection layers or by, uh, by loading the atoms onto more uh, a stable substrate or, or changing the coordination to make it stable. Uh, all the, these processes can be um, uh, can, uh, are on the way and uh, uh, give you um, a big picture about the uh, single atom catalyst because those catalysts are synthesize under very high temperature annealing. So they are very thermally stable actually because um, they, are, they are more tense to, to, to be doped in the defect of the graphene than uh, aggregates together because of formation energy. But when the current density coming up, uh, there is new challenges that could weakening the bond structures that um, uh, we were hoping that uh, in the future by changing the surrounding coordination or so on, uh, we can solve that problem. Well, thank you so much, Hao Chen. Uh, stay with us for the panel discussion. Now, let me invite our chief uh, editor, uh, Professor Terry Odom, to the stage to uh, moderate uh, a Jen Dayang session. Terry. Thanks, E. <laughs> it's good to see everyone here. Um, and if E is too uh, humble to trumpet his own success related to this these this webinar series is really his he and the early career boards brainchild and i think it's been incredibly successful so thanks he for doing all of this uh, work and uh, having such strong vision so um i'm very excited to introduce our last uh speaker for today jennifer dion she's one of our newest associate editors at, at nano letters and she's the Senior Associate Vice Provost uh, of Research Platforms and Shared Facilities and an Associate Professor of Material Science and Engineering and of Radiology at Stanford. And she serves as the co-director of Tomcat Center for Sustainable Energy, the director of Photonics at Thermodynamic Limits Energy Frontier Research Center and the faculty co-director of Stanford Photonics Research. She obtained her bachelor's in physics uh, and systems and electrical engineering from Wash U in St. Louis and her master's and PhD at uh, Caltech with Harry Atwater. She was also a postdoctoral researcher in uh, chemistry at Berkeley under uh, Paul Alipasados. 
and her uh, group is an uh, is an expert at developing uh, nanophotonic methods to observe and control chemical and biological processes as they unfold with nanometer scale resolution. And she's interested in especially critical challenges in global health and sustainability. She has been recognized with numerous um, prestigious awards. I will just mention a couple so that we can have enough time for her talk. Uh, she was uh, received the Alan T. Waterman Award, which is the top National Science Foundation uh, recognition across the sciences and engineering for young faculty. And she also received the NIH Director's uh, New Innovator Award and was a Moore Inventor Fellow as well. Um, she's been a PCAS uh, Fellow and she was also featured on Oprah's list of 50 things that will make you say, wow. So with that, Jen, we look forward to your talk. Cool. Thank you so much, Terry, for the introduction. And um, thanks, Yi and the Early Career Board for putting together these seminars. They have been such a great way to keep uh, the nanoscience community together throughout the pandemic. Um, it's really an honor to be a speaker here. Um, probably, I imagine, we'll have uh, a few more seminar series virtually, but it would be amazing to do some of these in person uh, once we can all get back together. Um, I was a bit torn on what to discuss today. We've heard two amazing talks from uh, John and Hao Tin, um, but I, I thought I'd discuss, I think, what's been on my mind for um, at least the past uh, year, if, if not a bit longer, which is how we can reimagine the conventional microbiology toolkit using uh, emerging nanophotonic platforms. And there are really two you know, key takeaways I want you to have from this talk, you know, one of which is how we can sense forces in biological systems, and the other is how we can sense fields um, in, in biological systems, or actually use electromagnetic fields to sense biosystems. So those are kind of the two key topics I'll describe in my talk today. You'll get to see the students and postdocs pictures throughout my presentation. The work would not have been possible without all of their contributions. But I also want to give a shout out to my collaborators, um, especially Stephanie Jeffrey and Miriam Goodman. Many of these collaborators are in Stanford School of Medicine, um, and in many ways they were inspiring for uh, the work that we're presenting today. So I wanted to start off with a quick overview of um, how our body works when a, a foreign invader comes along. And I chose the example of the COVID virus. We, of course, know that when um, a virus comes along like COVID, it'll inject its viral RNA um, into um, our host cells, um, thereby infecting it. And if a portion of the spike protein um, happens to leak off, it'll bind to one of our B cells um, on its membrane receptor, like a B cell receptor. And that actually initiates a cascade of events in our immune systems. Um, for example, oh, my uh, my let me go back. <laughs> My screen is jumping ahead. <clears throat> so for example, a T cell will come along and recognize a portion of the spike protein um, on one of the B cell receptors and actually induce the B cell to differentiate. Once it differentiates, it basically starts producing um, receptors at a very fast rate, a rate of about 2000 per second. And those receptors are what we now know as antibodies. So being nanoscientists, uh, antibodies are, are relatively large. They're about 12 nanometers long, 14 nanometers across. And once they latch onto um, the virus, then um, other cells like macrophages come along and essentially destroy um, the antibody decorated virus. So this talk, like I said, will focus on kind of forces and electromagnetic fields. And in the first part of my presentation, I want to describe an image or a vision that we have for how we might quantify mechanotransduction, especially between cells. And what motivates us is understanding immune responses and not just the biochemical response, but also the mechanical response that might be present at what are known as immune synapses. So these immune cell interfaces that basically cause differentiation and hence cause, for example, antibodies to be released. So how can we develop sensors of mechanical forces. And like I said, cells and immune um, synapses are really what motivate us. But as you'll see throughout my presentation, force actually manifests itself in a variety of biological systems. 
And then in the second part of my presentation, I want to describe how we can improve or develop improved um, COVID assays using uh, what we call high quality factor metasurfaces. And um, this part of my presentation really focuses on how we can detect various gene fragments. So it can be applied not only to COVID, to, but to a variety of diseases and, and also cell-free DNA. Okay, so in developing uh, mechanical force sensors, first I wanted to describe why it is that you might think there's force in these immune synapses, either at the interfaces between two immune cells or at the immune cell pathogen interface. And here's just an image um, of a T cell, which here is stained purple, um, which you can see is kind of latched onto um, a target cell. So this could be another immune cell or it could be a pathogen. And if you take a cryo electron microscope slice of this cell cell interface and zoom in, you'll notice that there's actually this pore that the T cell has inserted into the other cell. And this is a pore that basically uh, kind of opens up a hole um, in the other cell, so that way chemicals can be released, either instructing the cell to do something or targeting it for death. So as you can see, this pore is likely inducing quite a bit of force, um, and it's thought that the force of this immune cell pathogen or immune cell immune cell interface might actually play a really key role in how our immune systems respond and also might be a really good indicator of various immune therapies and yet there's no way to directly measure the forces at these cell-cell interfaces. If you look to the landscape of how people generally measure force, of course, atomic force microscopy is an extremely powerful method, um, but the size of the AFM probe that you'd use when it's attached to the cantilever is, is too large for a lot of um, in vivo or in situ work. There are also oil droplets, which, which can measure millinewton down to micronewton forces. And what you're basically doing is looking at how the shape of a spherical oil droplet is deformed when there are different cells kind of pressing on it. But again, it's not really ideal for in vivo work. As we get down to smaller sensors, and you can see here on the vertical axis, I've plotted the sensor size with respect to, for example, a red blood cell or um, a bacterial cell or a viral particle. These smaller sensors are really ideal for um, in vivo measurements, and many of them are actually optical based sensors. So whether you're working with plasmonic tethers or uh, FRET molecular pairs or quantum dots, generally the optical signal is a really great way to read out what the force might be um, in a nanoscale size sensor. The challenge with a lot of these optical sensors is that they generally contend with tissue autofluorescence. So many of these are excited in the visible or the ultraviolet range where our tissues also absorb and then subsequently emit light. And then importantly, a lot of these sensors suffer from photo bleaching. So you can't do recordings over many minutes or in some cases, many hours like you would need to for these immune synapses. And they also have a pure intensity change. So you're just looking at how the intensity of the emitted light is changing rather than, for example, the wavelength or the color. And that means that if you're trying to make an in vivo sensor, you'd have to contend with, you know, for example, how your tissue or organ or organism might be changing because that would change, for example, the incident laser intensity on your sensor. So ideally, we could get around a lot of these issues, including the autofluorescence, the photo bleaching, um, the dynamic range, and also the intensity change. And the method that we've been using for the last several years to overcome these issues are these lanthanide dope nanoparticles. So what we do is we rely on the F block of the periodic table and all of the four F transitions that come with those lanthanides um, to enable high fidelity um, optical sensing. And one of the key advantages of working with the F block is that they have a number of transitions that can bring you either within the two near infrared tissue transparency regions, you know, or from one of those two visible frequencies. And here I'm just showing you an image of a series of lanthanide doped nanoparticles, um, all excited with 980 nanometer light. And the efficiency of this up conversion process to go from the near infrared, infrared to the visible is actually relatively efficient. You can get up to a few percent efficiencies um, in some of these small nanoparticles. 
And even though their efficiency is not as high as what you might get with a quantum dot um, or a molecule, because near infrared light penetrates so much further um, through tissues um, and you don't have any autofluorescence, you can see here in this image of the rat, you can still clearly see the up conversion coming from some of these nanoparticles compared to what you would get with a much brighter quantum dot that's excited in the ultraviolet. And then at least in studies done um, before we kind of dove into this field, um, it appeared as if the nanoparticles had relatively low cytotoxicity. Of course, that needs to be evaluated in each system that you're going to be doing these uh, imaging experiments on. But um, for us, it seemed quite promising to put these lanthanidote nanoparticles into a variety of biological systems. The challenge in creating a force sensor is that these F electrons are extremely well shielded from their environment. So as you apply force onto a lattice, you're not going to be really deforming those F electrons as well um, as you might be with a, a different sensor or like something that's flexible, like a molecule. And just to illustrate kind of how um, challenging it is to get sensitivity out of these F electrons and these lanthanide ions, here I'm just including some of the salts that we would work with in making some of these lanthanide dope nanoparticles like an erbium oxide based salt or an erbium chloride based salt. And you can see that they're kind of a pale, like pinkish or purplish color, even though in both of these cases, you're swapping out the ligand field or the crystal field that's surrounding the erbium. So you've completely changed the nature of the atoms surrounding the erbium in this lattice, and yet there's only a very slight or very modest color change. And you can contrast that with what we all know from chemistry with these very diffuse D electronic um, energy levels, which are extremely sensitive to changes in their surroundings because they're so spread out around the atom. So if we take chromium and now consider a chromium oxide lattice or a chromium chloride lattice, you can see there's an extremely vivid color change uh, from purple to green. Similarly, if you were to dope uh, chromium and alumina oxide, that gives you the brilliant red color um, that we've seen in rubies. So our idea to create a force sensor that had a lot of the advantages of these lanthanide dope nanoparticles, including the ability to operate in tissue transparency windows, photostability, and low cytotoxicity with force sensitivity was to dope in D metals into these nanoparticles. So here I've included a diagram that's a lot like a, a fret transfer diagram, just to give you a flavor for how this works. So we have a single nanoparticle, um, generally a ceramic host. Um, in many of the particles I'll be showing you today, that's a sodium yttrium fluoride host lattice, but we've also worked with um, strontium and calcium yttrium fluoride host lattices. So basically looking at that alkaline earth or that group two of the periodic table. And then in that host lattice, we dope in the lanthanides and we also dope in the D metal. And for a lot of the particles you'll be seeing today, we're going to dope in ytterbium as the light absorber. So that will absorb most efficiently around 980 nanometers. And then erbium um, is the light emitter. So ytterbium as an ion transfers its energy over to um, erbium. So you can see the ytterbium erbium pairs is kind of the purplish and greenish pairs within the ceramic host lattice. And erbium emits largely in the green. There are kind of two subtle green peaks, which we label here as green one and green two, and also in the red. And then what we do is we dope in small concentrations of manganese, which has an energy level below one of the energy levels in erbium. So you can see the manganese here indicated in orange. And when the manganese is, um, or when the particle is compressed, the manganese energy level actually goes up. So we wind up changing <clears throat> the energy transfer from one of the erbium states um, to manganese. So we essentially turn off one of these peaks and cause the other peak, for example, the red peak to become stronger than the green peak. So here are some images of our synthesized nanoparticles. Uh, my students have become quite good in, in creating a variety of shapes and sizes, nanoparticle phases, and we get extremely monodispersed syntheses. So to illustrate how it is that applied force and applied pressure changes um, that red to green ratio that we see, 
Um, here were some of our earlier studies where we put our nanoparticles in between two diamond culettes. And this is uh, a technique called diamond anvil cell microscopy. It's a really simple way of just applying mechanical pressure onto nanoparticles simply by relying on the hardness of diamonds and then squishing the two diamonds together. And what we do is we use ruby uh, with its chromium uh, and force sensitive D metals as kind of a calibration to know what is the amount of force that we're applying. <clears throat> so we excite our nanoparticles at 980 nanometers and then we collect the visible light that's emitted at a range of pressures. And here you can see that as we apply pressure from ambient pressure um, up to, in this case, gigapascals, because diamond anvil cell microscopy is really good for those higher pressure regimes, we're significantly changing the red to green ratio. Note that the overall intensity is staying the same, but what I've done here is normalize the peak to this green peak that's being emitted right around 550 nanometers. So that way you can see there's quite a significant change in the red to green ratio. So in this case, when we apply pressure, the red peak goes up substantially and that gives rise to a corresponding color change. So if you just look at the images of the nanoparticles excited in the near infrared um, emitted in the visible, <clears throat> as you increase the pressure, the particles become more red and hence go from looking kind of this yellowish color to more of an orange color. And importantly, this process is repeatable. So there's no phase change or permanent phase change in the nanoparticle. We're just changing um, how that manganese energy level is um, located with respect to the erbium energy level. And you can also see that the change in the red to green ratio is linear with applied um, pressure. So if you correlate this pressure to a force by using the surface area of the nanoparticle, we estimated that the forces we were sensitive to were in the few micronewton regime. But to confirm that, we needed to develop um, a new method where we could directly apply force rather than hydrostatic pressure. And what we did is uh, make a home-built uh, confocal microscope um, that sits beneath an atomic force microscope. So that way we could use the AFM tip um, to press on individual nanoparticles that we synthesize and then simultaneously collect the spectra of those nanoparticles. So here you can see a confocal image where I've outlined individual nanoparticles in green that we've confirmed um, as being individual by also taking an atomic force microscope scan over our nanoparticles. And when we um, apply a force on these particular nanoparticles, this is actually our strontium host, when we went from no force up to three micronewtons, again, normalizing to the green peak, you can see the red peak goes down. And then when we go from three micronewtons back to ambient or no force being applied, the red peak goes up. So we again see that nice linear change in the red to green ratio, and it's repeatable. So as we increase the force and then decrease the force, we not only have that linear change, but we have repeatability over many cycles in this few micronewton down to nanonewton force regime. So for in vivo imaging, some of the first organisms that we focused on were C. elegans. These are small roundworms, which actually have 83% of their genes homologous to humans. Um, and one of the reasons why we started working with C. elegans is it has um, a really impressive rhythmic cycle of digestion. So it eats and digests its food and excretes its food roughly every 45 seconds. Um, so it's a really great organism for understanding various biological rhythms and clocks. And then additionally, it also has an indiscriminate palate. So this worm normally eats bacteria. Um, and it turns out you can just kind of sprinkle the nanoparticles on top of the bacteria um, and it'll uh, kind of chew it up as if, uh, as my colleague says, are kind of M&Ms on top. So here's a three-dimensional uh, confocal Z-scan where you can see the nanoparticles upconverting inside of C. elegans. And our goal was basically to show that we could feed the nanoparticles to C. elegans and then map out what are some of the forces involved in digestion of food. So here we incubated our nanoparticles overnight in bacteria, and you can see pre-feeding and post-feeding, the nanoparticles come out intact 
In fact, after feeding, they almost come out a little bit better, likely because some of the digestive acids kind of etched away some of the surface impurities. And there's also probably a bit of a, a protein corona around the nanoparticles. So before doing force imaging, we wanted to test the biocompatibility and we use one of the most common chronic um, cytotoxicity assays in C. elegans, which is called a brood assay. Essentially, you're identifying how many um, offspring uh, an adult worm will have, and you can do that by counting the number of eggs that the worm lays. And we can see that <clears throat> without nanoparticles and with nanoparticles, the number of eggs is roughly the same across multiple trials. So from this, we um, ascertain that nanoparticles don't have any chronic cytotoxicity effects on C. elegans. So if you collect the upconversion spectra within the worm um, at different spatial regimes we can, or regions, we can actually see the changes in the red to green ratio. So for example, zooming into the worm over here, we can look at the grinder, which is almost like the um, teeth or equivalent to the teeth of the worm. It's where the bacterial food gets kind of chewed and broken down. And then it gets uh, swallowed and passed into what's called the pharyngeal intestinal valve. So if we normalize to the green peak, just looking at the static image, you can see that there's a change in the red to green ratio. And if you compare that to particles either before they've gone into the worm or after they've been excreted, again, there's about a 6% change in the red to green ratio compared to the valve. So the grinder is where we would have expect to have seen some of the largest forces in this worm. <clears throat> And using our uh, calibration, we estimate that there are about uh, 10 micronewton forces being applied within the grinder and about one to two micronewton forces that are in the pharyngeal intestinal valve. So what's coming up next is basically being able to do correlated optical and electrical measurements of pharyngeal pumping. And this required a little bit of innovation in uh, the nanoparticle um, engineering simply because we wanted to have particles that were bright enough to be able to collect you know the very rapid um, pumping that we would see of the pharynx so here are images where the color scale shows the red to green ratio and you can see a change in the red to green ratio <clears throat> if we just zoom in but now looking at grayscale images of the up conversion in the worm here we're zooming into that grinder so basically the teeth and you can see when the grinder is relaxed, the pharyngeal intestinal valve is closed. So it's basically causing food to not go from basically the mouth or where the food is chewed into the intestine. Then the grinder inverts, the pharyngeal intestinal valve opens, food can go in. And what we can do is dynamically measure the change in the red to green ratio as the grinder is inverting. So here you can see the changes in the red to green ratio. And then we've put our worm essentially in a yeah, a miniaturized um, EEG, it's called an electropharyanogram, so that way we can correlate changes in the red to green ratio with changes in the electrophysiological signaling. And, and the hope here is to be able to correlate um, the electrical signaling to the mechanical signaling and better understand that interplay both in health and at the onset of disease. So here you can see many of the force peaks are correlated with the electrophysiological signals um, in some cases, if the pulses are coming extremely close together, you actually get a longer application of force. I'll also say what's upcoming is, is what motivated this work to begin with, which is how we can um, minimize uh, the force that we're able to detect. So in this case, we're um, able to detect forces in the about 10 nanonewton force regime. Um, which should be quite good for immune synapses, although we'd like to further um, decrease the minimal detectable force. Um, and I mentioned that manganese doping increases the force response. Core shelling um, is what we use to increase the brightness. Um, but this group two host lattice actually dramatically improves the sensitivity. So this is where instead of relying on a sodium-based lattice, we move over um, one column in the periodic table to, for example, strontium, calcium, or barium, which maintains the biocompatibility and also increases the sensitivity not only by virtue of the compliance of the host lattice, but also because it's a group two, you can more easily input um, uh, two plus D metals into the host lattice. So you can increase the amount of manganese doping. And then one other area that's upcoming in, in this uh, section of my talk that 
um, I think is also fun is that yeah, we've done the worm studies <clears throat> and we're starting to really understand the basis of forces in vivo in invertebrates, but we wanted to know, could we apply this to vertebrates as well? And you know, maybe get to the point where we're able to do, for example, some in vivo human monitoring of forces. So as one of the first um, examples of this, what we did is focus on uh, mice. Um, and the worm is essentially a hollow organ. Um, you know, it uh, ingests its food, it uh, digests it. Um, so another equivalent hollow organ is thinking about um, the intestinal system or, or the colon in vertebrates. And we know that mice um, have fecal pellets that are roughly about eight millimeters long. Um, so to understand, I guess, how the colon works in, in mice, normally what people do um, in neurophysiology is uh, input kind of artificial fecal pellets that have a compliance match to that of normal mouse fecal pellets and then just look at the distension of the colon and do electrical recordings. Um, but instead of looking at the distension, we thought maybe we could use an optical sensor to get a more quantitative um, and more rapid readout of the interplay between electrical and mechanical forces in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, so here's the mouse colon, which I said is part of the enteric nervous system, so it actually functions in an autonomous fashion. You can remove it from uh, the mouse and, and still watch it contract. Um, and then we inserted the um, pellet mimic, um, which in this case is a polymer with a compliance match to that of a normal mouse fecal pellet. Um, and then uh, inserted uh, upconverting nanoparticles into these pellets. So that way we could look at the change in the red to green ratio um, as the mouse colon kind of contracts. So this is where kind of our worm studies are headed. We're super excited to start applying these um, to vertebrate systems and uh, correlating electrical forces to mechanical forces. Um, anyway, that brings me to about spring of last year when of course, uh, everything shut down and um, I became a, a kind of stay at home Spanish immersion and um, kindergarten and preschool teacher. So here are my two little guys where, yeah, I taught them some optics with diffraction glasses. I also taught them how to grow um, not quite nanoparticles, but at least, uh, you know, micron scale um, crystals. And then here are some of my students who, of course, perfected their sourdough recipes and um, beer making. Um, and here's our very own Yi. We uh, had a chance to get together with um, our department for dinner right before um, the shutdown. And this is what motivated my lab to uh, pursue um, kind of a, a parallel area in developing um, improved sensors of um, gene fragments, particularly viral gene fragments um, for faster diagnostics. So I'll spend about five minutes just describing um, this work because I, I know we're relatively close to the top of the hour and I don't wanna keep people past 9 a.m. So if you look to modern diagnostics like um, polymerase chain reaction or an ELISA assay um, or even a fluorescence immunoassay, um, they generally rely on traditional optical signals like fluorescence or absorption to indicate the presence or lack um, of an antigen. And because of that, they often face a trade-off between either very high sensitivity, for example, in PCR, you can get extreme um, sensitivity, but it takes a while to prepare the sample. You need to go through many um, thermal cycles to amplify the nucleic acid that you're trying to detect. So PCR generally takes a few hours, um, despite its high sensitivity, because you need to amplify your signal. Meanwhile, fluorescence immunoassays you know, are quite quick. They're at the point of care, but they have a very high limit of detection. And that gave rise to a lot of the false positives that we were seeing, especially at the start of the pandemic. So our idea was to, um, instead of relying on traditional optics, um, utilize advances in modern optics, which we thought could enable rapid, um, specific and quantitative assays. So the idea is to rely on silicon, and I think this kind of brings us full circle to John Rogers' talk where he was developing kind of silicon electronics um, for uh, you know, implantable biology. Here we're developing silicon photonics um, for biosensors. So we have these ultra thin silicon chips that can precisely control the amplitude phase and polarization of light. And each 
um, nanostructure. Each nano antenna is kind of independent of its neighbors. So that allows you for multiplex detection um, of gene fragments. So each position on a detector corresponds to um, a different gene fragment that you might want to sense. So kind of a key design criteria um, in these metasurfaces is to concentrate and amplify the amount of light that is on your sample. So that way you can sensitively detect gene fragments. And if you think about just illuminating a silicon slab with um, light, um, normally you're just going to get the transmitted light showing a number of peaks and dips that correspond to Fabry-Perot resonances of the sample. But we know that there's also a waveguide mode that can be excited. This is a lot like the mode that you'd have in a fiber optic. It's just that normally incident light or light that's coming from the top can't really excite this waveguide mode because its wave vector or its momentum is higher than the momentum of light in free space. So what we do is insert um, a grating or basically grooves into the silicon slab. And if we have a grating with a period of 650 nanometers, um, that is going to couple to a photon energy of 1.47 microns. So you'll see here when I animate in um, with the addition of the grating, the electric field gets boosted up by about 100x and we have this extremely sharp high quality factor resonance. Um, so a lot of times people think I'm just drawing a blue line here, but you can see the zoom in kind of classic Fano line shape where we're taking normally incident light um, and coupling it into this waveguide mode, creating what's called a guided mode resonance. And the sharpness of this peak and the strong electromagnetic field enhancement is really crucial for high fidelity sensing. Um, and the sharpness of the peak is embodied in, in what people would call a quality factor. So we can achieve quality factors in the thousands um, to tens of thousands um, in these structures, which gives us very high fidelity sensing. And in addition to the high quality factor, another advantage of these nano antennas is that because the high quality factor comes from independent silicon bars, so now I've basically taken that silicon slab and rotated it into an out of the page, we can also steer light. So here I've shown you how we can get, for example, beam steering to a particular angle. You can also get focusing or beam splitting. And this is really key to be able to do multiplex detection. So here are just some simulations that I'm showing of how with bars that are different widths, you can start to get a variety of optical transfer functions, including in this case, um, beam steering. So in some of our measurements kind of pre-COVID, we showed how we can enable extremely high quality factor phase gradient metasurfaces that enable, for example, beam steering, lensing, beam splitting. Um, here's just one example where you can see we put notches into one of these silicon bars. Those notches, like I showed you earlier, significantly concentrate light. So you get strong field um, amplification. And then here we have beam steering to 45 degrees. And if you zoom into what's happening here, right around a wavelength of about 1400 to 1500 nanometers, you can see dips in that plus first order diffraction pattern corresponding to an extremely high quality factor resonance, in this case, a high Q resonance over a thousand. Okay, so I mentioned that high Q resonance is key for biosensing. So the key idea here is that we're going to functionalize the surface with single strands of DNA that are complementary to the viral nucleic acid that we want to sense. And when the viral nucleic acid binds, um, it gives rise to a shift in the dip in that transmission spectrum that we see. So here are some of our fabricated structures for biosensing where you can see the dip um, in that transmitted spectrum is comparable to a nanosecond laser. And generally we found that to get about nanomolar sensitivity, we can fabricate structures with cues um, of about 1500. So here we have um, chains of, of blocks that allow for high fidelity sensing. Each um, row of blocks is independent from its neighbors. And here you can see kind of each of these you can think about as a resonator. So if we look at resonator A and resonator B, they have slightly different resonances um, that you can see here in the spectra. 
And if we functionalize each of these with different st strands of nucleic acids, we can um, simultaneously monitor in the images how each of these spectral shifts is changing. So we can look, for example, at how resonator A is changing its resonance, how resonator B is changing its resonance. And we can pattern literally millions of these on a single chip. So we're limited more so by just how precisely we can do the functionalization. Okay, so to determine the sensitivity of the assay, what we did is flow in um, salt water, so different concentrations of, of salt in our water, which slowly changes the refractive index. So we had a home-built kind of 3D printed flow cell that allowed us to introduce um, saline water and at different weight concentrations of the salt, we're able to get a nice linear change in that resonant wavelength shift with um, a sensor sensitivity of about 300 or over 300 nanometers per refractive index unit. And then for sensitive uh, gene fragment detection, what we do is functionalize the surface essentially with single stranded DNA um, with a known concentration. And then we flow in uh, the viral nucleic acid um, and look at changes in the resonant wavelength upon binding. So basically upon hybridization of the single stranded DNA with the viral nucleic acid. And with COVID, uh, we partnered with the clinical um, virology lab at Stanford um, and decided to focus on two gene sequences that are each about 25 nucleotides long. Um, the NCOV E gene, um, which was used predominantly in the EU, and then the Hong Kong open reading frame. So if you look at each um, step of the functionalization as you go from the blank silicon wafer all the way to the fully functionalized wafer for example with the single stranded dna we get roughly a half to one nanometer shift at each step of the functionalization um, and then when we go from uh, the single stranded dna to um, kind of that double stranded duplex where we have the viral rna plus a single stranded dna we can actually get wavelength shifts within about 10 minutes or certainly no more than 10 minutes um, of introducing the nucleic acid. The sensor is also extremely specific to the targeted genomic sequence. So if we look at the complementary um, probe, we can get about a nice one nanometer shift. If we look at the non-complementary probe, um, we get no shift um, in the resonance that we're seeing. And that's confirmed by fluorescence imaging, where we take our target nucleic acid and we bind it um, with a fluoroform. So we can use fluorescence imaging as kind of a, a nice control to show that when we have the complementary nucleic acid, we do get strong binding. When we have the non-complementary viral nucleic acid to what we put down on the surface, we get minimal fluorescence. So this is one of my final slides, which kind of shows you how this particular biosensor fits in with the landscape of existing sensors. And in many ways, I think we're standing on the shoulders of giants um, with folks who have spent you know, years developing, for example, resonators that have extremely precise kind of spatial or diffractive control, which is really crucial for multiplexing and being able to independently assign different nano antennas to different genetic fragments. But generally, these have suffered from low quality factors. And then if you look to sensors that have extremely high sensitivity and therefore high quality factors like photonic crystals or ring resonators, unfortunately, there you wind up compromising the degree of spatial or diffractive control you could get. So here, normally, the high quality factor comes from kind of extended periodic structures. Or in the case of ring resonators, you need to couple light in using fibers. So what this work does is show that the trade-off between spatial and diffractive control and sensitivity is by no means fundamental. We can develop these high quality factor metasurfaces that can enable sensitive and multiplex detection. And I think the promise of this, going back to John Rogers' comment on how you might scale this, is that you know, it's a, a very lightweight kind of flexible form factor that you could put into a number of applications for translation. And then you also leverage, of course, CMOS compatibility. So you, these are simply silicon structures that you can create over large areas. Um, so with that, you know, hopefully I've uh, convinced you that nanophotonics does have a place in the microbiology lab. Um, like I said, I focus on kind of forces and then electromagnetic fields in the beginning, showing how upconverting or these rare earth nanoparticles enable visualization of forces. 
and then in the second part of my presentation describing how um, we can detect various gene fragments in a sensitive multiplex format using high quality factor meta surfaces. And with that, I'd like to thank um, our funders. Um, I'd also like to put um, a huge shout out to all of my students and postdocs without whom this work would not be possible. And a big thanks to Nano Letters for yeah, supporting my career. Um, kind of like how to in one of my earliest uh, publications was in Nano Letters. And um, it's been so wonderful to follow the journal over the last 20 years and, and now to be a part of it. So thank you so much for your attention. And I don't know if you saw in the background, but it's, uh, it's about school time for our two little guys. So they came bounding in. Uh, about midway through my talk. So apologies if uh, <laughs> you heard the screams in the background, but thank you all. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, we're a little bit over the time for your question. So what we would like to do um, is to open up for the, the panel discussion, partly because this is a, a characteristic, it's a feature that's unique to the webinars, is to get three of the uh, eminent scholars together and to discuss some of their vision and, and their future. But but I just wanted to say thank you for the elegant talk. We it just ran a little bit, just a little bit over. Uh, e, so I'll just uh, transition uh, to you. Yeah, maybe I'll ask one question now. Terry could have a, another one for panel discussion. Uh, so we started this uh, the Nanoscience Global Lecture back in September. So this is the eighth one. So I remember when we started with uh, Paul Oliver Santos and Steve Chu and, and uh, Leo, we asked the questions, right? What are the exciting directions for nanotechnology to go? Um, and uh, I want to ask you these questions as well. Today, you uh, three of you present a very exciting past research, ongoing research, right? But you think what's coming uh, for the next decade? So do you want to share with us, maybe each, each person like a minute or so? <laughs> John, we can start from you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm highly biased. I mean, I think nanotechnology is going to have a, a, an important role in the sorts of programs that, that we're doing, you know, and, and if I thought, you know, there were some better directions to go, we, we go in those directions. So I think, you know, <laughs> biointerface is interesting. You know, I think energy science, maybe, maybe more generally, you know, I think the field of nanotechnology has kind of grown up at this point. You know, I think it's evolved over time. It seemed to be dominated in the early days by, you know, just different structures that could be grown or formed. And, and it was kind of observational, I guess, in, in its orientation, maybe focused on basic scientific aspects of uh, you know, materials, chemistry, and confinement effects, and so on. I mean, it dates all the way back. We are talking about Bell Labs before. I think probably semiconductor nanocrystals may be the earliest, one of the earliest forms of nanotechnology is uh, strictly defined. But, you know, I think um, as time has evolved, you know, it's, it's matured to a point where, you know, I think the future directions, the most compelling ones in, in my uh, estimation would be those that uh, intersect with uh, grand challenges, you know, uh, for society. And so we heard about carbon, uh, you know, and in, in the environment. And Jen's talking about, you know, all these interesting biology applications. We're kind of working in that space too. And so I think it's like nanotechnology with purpose, you know, where where you know, th th you know, there, there, there's maybe a stronger engineering consequence to to some of the activities that you see. Would be my my perspective on it. Excellent. Uh, Hao Chen? Well, uh, first of all, it's a little bit nervous for me to speak about nanotechnology development in front of so you know, well-developed researchers here. Uh, but uh, from my perspective, I, I, I completely agree with John that the, uh, there will be a lot of uh, frontiers for nanotechnology to tackle the challenge problems that our human beings are facing, including the pandemic as well as uh, the global climate change. So. Um, uh, in my, you know, research field, the, uh, the nanotechnology development catalysis is, is obviously very important, uh, and not only because the catalytic performance is way better uh, than bulk materials, but also you, when you start to dig into a, a smaller and smaller size of materials, they are, um, they are intrinsic um, catalytic behaviors become so interesting. For example, what I, what we uh, discussed earlier about the single atom catalyst. So 
uh, with the, 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 the urgent need of the um, uh, climate change and the, the uh, energy revolution uh, from the traditional fossil fuels to the renewable electricity, I believe the nanotechnology will play central roles uh, in energy storage and green chemicals and the fuel cell synthesis, including, you know, uh, in your focus on the batteries research, uh, as well as the uh, uh, catalysis research. Um, a lot of the um, uh, frontiers are, are going very excitingly um, uh, interesting, in also including the CO2 reductions, how, how we are dealing with these CO2s. I, I believe the nanotechnologies will play a central role uh, in the next 10 years or so. Jan? Yeah, I'll just, you know, I, I think the two panelists said it perfectly. I think we can apply nanomaterials to you know, some of the grand challenges that we're seeing in energy, sustainability, and health, and information. Um, two key things I want to add that I think are really exciting avenues for nanoscience. One that was kind of touched upon in, in how Chin's talk, but I think is also relevant to example for, you know, quantum computing is this ability to do kind of atomically precise you know, science where we look at how the properties of individual atoms in materials are, um, you know, influencing their overall system performance. And I think that's going to be a really exciting area for catalysis and sustainability. Also in, in quantum science, where a lot of the, um, you know, single photon emitters or, you know, spin qubits are essentially atomic defects in materials. And if we want to enable kind of quantum interconnects or QIS, I think we need to come to a point where we can better understand how the properties of individual atoms or defects, you know, uh, interface with our system. Kind of the other area I want to mention that I think is exciting for nanoscience, not only in the applications, is the ability to kind of scale up a lot of these nanomaterials. So John and I talked about how we can leverage, for example, you know, uh, silicon, you know, fabrication and processing, but um, I think additive manufacturing and 3D printing and being able to incorporate nanomaterials in kind of bulk composites that we're printing is a, a really exciting direction, especially when we think about not only materials for health and sustainability, but, you know, for example, new building materials that we're creating, you know, kind of from the bottom up. Carrie, okay, back to you. I, th I think we're uh, reached almost the time limit, so I wanted to just make sure that we are on um, that we're that we're good. So I'll I'll hold. I'll let you I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah. So well, thank you, Terry. Well, let let me thank everybody for your fantastic talk. So uh, uh, in this uh, global uh, lecture series, we have been having eight uh, lecture events. So that has been very, very exciting to me. I, I hope for the whole community. I would like to thank everybody, uh, the audience, the American Chemical Society, and also uh, our chief editor, Terry, here, and our early career board for, for the support of this event. Um, since now we see the light close to the end of the tunnel through the COVID, uh, Terry and I discussed this, uh, indeed, this will be our last lecture event for this whole series. Um, certainly in the future, well, I hope there's no, no more COVID coming. Uh, <laughs> I look forward to uh, seeing uh, everybody in person. Thank you so much. This concludes uh, today's event.